Hello, saints. Welcome to our channel as Sisters in Zion. Our names are KB, Antonia, and Courtney, and we are excited to share our insights with all of you and welcome you to comment below with what you've learned this last week. Feel free to share this video with others as well. There are some online resources and communities that are linked in the description below. Without further ado, let's get into the scriptures. And we've been continuing our study in the Book of Alma, and we are now in chapter 17 through 22. I will make thee an instrument. I will make an instrument of thee. And we'll start out with KB. So the topic uh, is knowing God is worth any sacrifice. I love that in the Come Follow Me manual. It and there's a heading on that. So I wanted to really focus on that. Um, and in Alma 22, 15, and then 18, 15 says, and it came to pass that after Aaron had expounded um, these things unto him, the king said, what shall I do that I may have this eternal life of which thou hast spoken? Yea, what shall I do that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast and receive his spirit? that I may be filled with joy, that I may not be cast out at the last day. Behold, said he, I will give up all that I possess. Yea, I will forsake my kingdom that I may receive this great glory, great joy. And then on verse 18, it says, O oh God, Aaron hath told me that there is a God. And if there is a God, and if thou art God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me? And I will give away all my sins to know thee, and that I may be raised from the dead and be saved at the last day. And now when the king had said these words, he was struck as if he were dead. Um, <clears throat> the gospel of Jesus Christ challenges us to change. Repent is its most frequent message, and repenting means giving up all of our practices, personal, family, ethnic, and national, that are contrary to the commandments of God. The purpose of the gospel is to transform common creatures into celestial citizens, and that requires change. In Doctrine and Covenants Instructional Guide, I, I just stumbled on this, and it was gold for me. So hopefully this will help someone um, like it did me. And maybe it's just for me. <laughs> Nothing less than complete devotion to God and his work will qualify men for a celestial reward. A, throughout the ages, men of God have emphasized the need to love and serve the Lord with all one's heart, might, mind, and strength. Some have failed in this quest because they have accepted the evil precepts of other men or have followed the enticements of Lucifer. Those who are lukewarm about the gospel or who willfully turn their backs on God cannot attain celestial glory. Point number, I mean, uh, letter number B, which is a second point. Righteous men and women have always applied their hearts and minds to understanding and obeying the laws of God. Which means understanding comes through study, faith, and earnest prayer. Um, the second point is once he understands what to do and how to do it, the righteous person strives with all his heart to obey what he knows and feels is right. In the basic library, it gives you some things um, to explore. I love this concept. Um, um, from If you go back up to the top, it shows you the resource. That um, instruction guide for a religion 30, 324 and 325 so um institute okay so keep going and find the next there's some additional um points okay there are in this life certain truths so fundamental that you must be established so firmly in our minds and hearts that no further proof of their veracity is required to meet the tests of mortality, our Heavenly Father has provided a certain witness of those crucial understandings within which we can fit the additional light and knowledge we may later receive. 
We may not know all the answers, indeed. We may not comprehend all the questions, but we will have established in our lives a certain framework of understanding that will provide not only an unshakable intellectual and spiritual foundation, but will also transform our very lives. What is this witness that gives us understanding that transcends the understanding of the senses? The witness of the Holy Ghost. The understanding received from the Holy Ghost has three key aspects. First, it concerns the most critical and transcendent truths. Second, it is definitive in its certitude. And third, it changes behavior. So the prophet Joseph Smith said that there were three certitudes necessary for a man or woman to endure the trials of life and knowledge that God is an understanding of his nature, attributes, and perfections, and a conviction that the course of life we are pursuing is in accord with his will. If, on the other hand, we begin with the premises that mortal life arose by design and will develop according to eternal law. So he gave the opposite. If you're just focusing on the physical, the biological, the social information that we receive, we such thoughts will have consequences on how society operates and how we act. But on the other hand, if we begin with the premise that mortal life arose by design and will develop according to eternal law, we will understand the bits and pieces of our information in a different way. We will see the interconnectedness and wholeness of life. We will grasp the hierarchy of truth. We will see patterns and purpose where others see disorder and chance. Job grasped, grasped the cri criticality of the original premise when even in the depths of his misery, he declared, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? And unto man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. We risk preaching for established truth, the transitory doctrines of men, seeing as Paul expressed it, only puzzling expressions in a mirror, whereas we are summoned by our Heavenly Father to see him face to face. As Paul wrote, my knowledge now is partial. Then when illuminated by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, it will be whole like God's knowledge of me. Second, as already suggested, this knowledge is definitive. Although our experiences, our observations, and rational faculties may lead us to certain conclusions, they can never compel the conviction that dispels doubt and motivates endurance. Jesus said to Peter that neither flesh nor blood led him to understand that Jesus is the Christ, but his Father which is in heaven. As Paul wrote, no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Can you see why it is a fearful thing to deny the witness of the Holy Ghost? Unlike other evidence, it ends argument. Such verification by the Spirit carries a certitude unknown in any other area of thought. There may be many philosophical demonstrations to relative to the ex existence of God, or the divine sonship of Jesus, or the truthfulness of the restoration, but they remain in the arena, arena of speculation, no matter how convincing. Alma argues that as we submit our will to the Father through faith in Christ, our understanding doth begin to be enlightened and our mind doth begin to expand. In latter days, the Lord has said that he requireth the heart and a willing mind and counseled us to treasure up in our minds continually the words of life, sanctifying ourselves that our mind become single to God, and the day will come that we shall see him, for he will unveil his face unto us. The transforming power of spiritual knowledge is not limited to the individual. As Paul observed, as we as a people bend our will to God and make our minds single to his, the community of saints will be made perfect. I'm going to read that again. As Paul observed, as we as a people bend our will to God and make our minds single to his, the community of the saints will be made perfect. 
so that there will be no division among us and we will be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I love that. I think that's powerful. How the requirements of obtaining spiritual knowledge, how do we attain to such comprehensive, definitive and transforming knowledge? Let us consider four aspects of the requirements for obtaining spiritual knowledge. First, an urgent search for the truth. Second, a willingness to obey the truth so discovered. Third, a disposition to bear witness to the truth in all places and in all times. And fourth, a motivation to serve others in truth. And then <clears throat> receptivity and diligent learning, a form of humility first. Then we must be open to teaching and diligent in our pursuit of the learning of the spirit. Such a pursuit requires a sense of our own need and more than a casual interest in the answers we seek. The Lord has declared that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. But he also said, woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. The Lord declared to John the Revelator that he would reject those who are lukewarm, being neither cold nor hot, having the feeling that they are self-sufficient and have need of nothing. <clears throat> obedience having pursued the truth with diligences we must then be prepared to obey the truth alma speaks of awakening arousing our faculties that is our heart and mind so as to experiment upon the word surely this refers not to passive learning but active doing and witnessing and serving. Finally, if we are to acquire spiritual knowledge, we must be prepared to witness to the truth to which we have attained and be willing to serve and edify others in the truth, having as Enos a desire for the welfare of our brethren. So my thought, if we go back up to the scripture at the top, I'll tie all this in. Um, so we talked about... Um, the experience, um, and I will give away all my sins to know thee, and that I may be raised from the dead and be saved at the last day. Those, it's such a comprehensive st statement of what he was, King Lamoni was willing to do um, when he just he had that experience of the Holy Ghost and teaching him. Of, about just much more than just giving away the things that he had um, in mortality. Um, his mind expanded. And once we have our minds expanded to the truth, we have um, a whole world opens up before us and truth becomes... Um, rooted in um, God and it is not changing with any no matter what dispensation we are in it it is rooted and grounded and firm in its foundation and once we catch hold of that and we um, understand that um, to the point where we live it breathe it understand it open our minds so that the spirit can teach us. Um, it leads us into that, um, the redemption of Zion that we are longing to be a part of, um, being made um, perfect and one in community and thought in our actions, we become one. I just thought this was beautifully um, said and articulated and um and powerful and i just want to bear my testimony that i know the gospel of jesus christ is true and that as we yield our will to the father and and the son that our minds are um can be open and true understanding and diligence and actions become its byproduct and I testify of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
um, I was reading earlier this scripture, which um, not scripture, but a commentary from uh, uh, David A. Bednar. And he says that um, when you teach uh, by the power of the Holy Ghost, which we know that Aaron, this is what Aaron is doing. He's teaching by the power of the Holy Ghost to the king. Uh, the king then, it says that when a man speaketh by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth the message onto the hearts of the children of men, as in 2 Nephi 33, 10. He says, it says, notice how the power of the Spirit carries the message onto, but not necessarily into the heart. A teacher can explain, demonstrate, persuade, and testify, and do so with great spiritual power and effectiveness. Ultimately, however, the content of a message and the witness of the Holy Ghost penetrate into the heart only if a receiver allows them to enter. And obviously, um, the king here was already, um, we'll, we'll go back and remember that, that um, uh, the king had already um, uh, had interaction with Ammon and the effect that he had had on his son. You know, uh, we, we know that Ammon had uh, the opportunity to kill the king, but didn't. And uh, uh, rejected any any um, uh, um, monetary um, um, pay for um, not killing him, and uh, just to liberate his brothers. And as he pondered these things, he I, I'm sure he thought, you know, this guy I could have given him half of my kingdom, and all he wanted was my son restored. He really truly loved my son. And he had some kind of power, you know, and he pondered this. And those are the things that softened his heart. But ultimately, he was willing, like Elder Bernard says, he was willing to listen to that. And then here we see that he's acting on it. He is wanting to give away his sins to know. And he wants to be raised from the dead because he knew that this indeed had happened to his son, or at least they thought that he had been dead. And so he was pondering these things and pondering him himself where he stood before God because he's praying to the Lord and saying, you know, um, make thou self known unto me, right? Because he was he was there with, with a broken heart and contrite spirit, which is what he asks of us. And as you were reading this, um, it reminded me when we were building our home, um, I just envisioned when we were here in our home and it was just the foundation and then they put the the framework up it was hard to envision all of the rooms they look so tiny because of the of the the, the construction how it how it was all being put together but see that's how our heavenly father works with us he works with us one step at a time each room at a time when we're ready we don't know how it all comes together in the end you know but if we are willing to submit ourselves to his will and allow him to work with us where we're at, whether it's in the living room or in the kitchen or the dining room or wherever it may be, he works with us. And we, we then have faith and trust in him that he's, he's going to put it all together. And we don't have to worry about that. We just need to be obedient with wherever we're at and whatever he has us and wherever he has us to listen to his voice. Anyway, so that's what my part contributing to your thought came to mind. He definitely is going, he's, uh, the purpose of the gospel is to tr transform us common creatures into cel celestial citizens. And in order to do that, we must change. And that comes through understanding the gospel principles. Awesome. Hi, Courtney. How's Courtney? Good. Hey, I I really enjoyed this thought. And um, what really kind of pricked me is when um, you were reading the part about, and I would give away all my sins to know thee. And um, I personally feel like I must be a very slow learner <laughs> because Heavenly Father continues 
to give me experiences that not only humble me down to the point where I'm willing to say, I need comfort, I need relief, I need, you know, something to help me get through this experience. Like I'll give everything away if I can just, you know, kind of have that reassurance that I'm loved, that I'm for me, I have one of the So I'm not because I continue to have experiences where my only option is to rely on the Lord. Um, because I I can't lean to my own understanding. I can't you know, navigate my way out of a situation. And so I have to give it to the Lord. So I really, I really enjoyed that part. I always kind of struggle as well with Alma the Younger um, because it makes me think as well about, you know, what about the parents who are crying and praying mightily to Heavenly Father that they can have an experience like that in their children's lives. And I think a lot of times that that can be a struggle, specifically with, with members of the church who kind of want these miraculous experiences. Um, you know, and I don't think we always put Alma the Younger and Layman and Lemuel together the way that we should, right? They both fought angels. They were both commanded to repent and return. Yes, we have the experience of Alma the Younger, but we also have the, that experience of Layman and Lincoln. We have those experiences of parents who cried out night and day, and those prayers were not answered in the way that they wanted, which doesn't mean that the Lord loved their children less. I think we need to keep that larger perspective. And that was my thought. Thank you, Courtney. All right. Um, let's move on to uh, the second insight, or my, my first insight, I'm sorry. Um, my first insight comes out from uh, almost 17, didn't get very far, did I? Uh, in verses one through four, and um, and that scripture reads as follows. Now it came to pass that as Alma was journeying from the land of Gideon southward away from the land of Manti, behold, to his astonishment, he met with the sons of Mosiah journeying toward, journeying, journeying toward the land of Zarahemla. Now these sons of Mosiah were with Alma at the time the angel first appeared to him. Therefore, Alma did rejoice exceedingly to see his brethren. And what added more to his joy, they were still his brethren in the Lord. Yea, and they had waxed strong in the knowledge of the truth, for they were men of a sound understanding, and they had searched the scriptures diligently that they might know the word of God. But this is not all. They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. Therefore, they had the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation. And when they taught, they taught with the power and authority of God. They had been teaching the word of God for a space of 14 years among the Lamanites, having had much success in bringing many to the knowledge of the truth. Yea, by the power of their words, many were brought before the altar of God to call on his name and confess their sins before him. So simple, consistent acts of devotion to Christ help me receive his power. So what do we learn about keeping our testimony and commitment to Jesus strong? Well, what did the sons of Mosiah do and how did they, the Lord bless them? Well, as we just read, the spiritual preparation that affected their service among the Lamanites, which were what they said, um, they were men of sound understanding because they had searched the scriptures diligently. 
and they gave themselves to prayer, fasting, and because of that, they had the spirit of prophecy revelation, and they taught with the power and authority of God. So what did Ammon and his brethren do to prepare and share the gospel with power and authority, and what can we do to implement these principles? So firstly, they searched the scriptures as an essential part of their missionary preparation. Likewise, Hiram Smith received counsel from the Lord to prepare for missionary service by seeking first to obtain his word. In the missionary handbook, the Preach My Gospel emphasizes the importance of seeking the Holy Ghost, having a strong desire to learn, and putting what we learn into action as key components of effective gospel study. Your gospel study is most effective when you are taught by the Holy Ghost. Always begin your gospel study by praying for the Holy Ghost to help you learn. He will bring knowledge and conviction that will bless your life and allow you to bless the lives of others. Your faith in Jesus Christ will increase. Your desire to repent will improve and grow. The kind of study prepares you for service, offers solace, reserves, resolves problems, and gives you strength to endure to the end. Successful gospel study requires desire and action. For he that diligently seeketh shall find. And the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto them by the power of the Holy Ghost, as well as in these times as in times of old. Like Enos, as you hunger to know the words of eternal life, and as you allow these words to sink deep into your heart, the Holy Ghost will open your mind and your heart to greater light and understanding. Learning the gospel is also a process of receiving revelation. In addition to preach my gospel, they recommend the use of a scriptural journal as one way to increase the power of your scripture study. By recording your thoughts and impressions while studying your scriptures, you open new avenues of receiving personal revelation. A study journal can help you understand, clarify, and remember what you are learning. Elder Richard G. Scott taught, knowledge carefully recorded is knowledge available in time of need. Spiritually sensitive information should be kept in a sacred place that can communicates to the Lord how you treasure it. This practice enhances the likelihood of you receiving further light. Review your study journal to recall spiritual experiences, see new insights, and recognize your growth. Your study journal may be a bound journal, a notebook, or a binder. Record and organize your thoughts and impressions in a way that fits how you learn. Develop your own system to easily access key information in the future. Use it often to review, access, and apply what you have learned. Use your study journal to take notes and record impressions. The other thing that the, that the, that the missionaries did was they had the power of fasting and prayer in the Lord's service. Um, Elder Russell, M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of Twelve uh, related this uh, story. He says, some years ago, a faithful convert, Brother George McLaughlin, was called to preside over a small branch of 20 members in Farmingdale, Maine. He was a humble man who drove a milk delivery truck for a living. Through his fasting and earnest prayer, the Spirit taught him what he and the members of his branch needed to do to help grow, help the church grow in their area. Through his great faith, constant prayer, and powerful example, he taught his members how to share the gospel. It's a marvelous story one of the great missionary stories of, his, of this dispensation. In just one year, there were 450 convert baptisms in the branch. The next year, there were an additional 200 converts. So um, back to the original scripture, which was, again, what added to Alma's joy is that his brethren were still brethren in the Lord. And as we know the story, the sons of Mosiah had um, gone through intense, intense tribulation. Um, when all, when um, Ammon found them and was um, they were being released from prison, they were in prison and they were naked. They were naked. They had been abused. Um, they had been... Um, um, whipped and they had also been starved um and um how um faithful were these brothers in that um 
they were not um, rebelling because they were in the service of the Lord and that they had undergone through such trials and they, they had become such strong men of God. And their example is, is humbling to me that um, in spite of all of their travail, they had um, searched the scriptures and um, learned how to pray well. I hope and I pray that, um, that we can uh, get just an ounce of what they had to be able to uh, be faithful uh, men and women as they are. Um, I'm going to read you something that I read uh, earlier in regards to um, studying, which were um, quotes from one from uh, President Ezra Taft that I didn't include here, but he says that um, that it is fundamental to this um, to mean that uh, the living prophet has the power of TNT, which means Today's news today. Therefore, the most important reading we can do is any of the words of the prophet contained each month in our church magazines. Our marching orders for the six months are found in the general conference addresses, which are printed in the Ensign or the Liahona magazine in following the prophet. Spencer, uh, President Spencer W. Kimball also encouraged church members to obtain a copy of the conference issue of the church magazines and make it part of their gospel library. I hope you will get your copy of the Ensign or Liahona and underline the pertinent thoughts that keep it with you for a continual reference. No text or volume outside the standard works of the church should have such a prominent place in your personal library shelves, not for their rhetorical excellence or eloquence of delivery, but for the concepts which point the way to eternal life. Um, so, brothers and sisters, may we, may I, um, be uh, better examples and missionaries like the sons of Mosiah and um, Aaron and Alma um, and Ammon, that they, they um, the example that they've set before us and that we may not uh, shirk at our responsibilities as sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope so hope and pray uh, that that is your desire and prayer. And I share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, the thing that just popped into my head, I, I, I this this notion of desire and action. You know, the sons of Messiah were um, not always full of desire and action. In fact, they were um, they were coupled with Alma in trying to destroy the church. And their conversion was so miraculous. Think about that. Their conversion was so miraculous that they had an increase. They had a desire that was so strong. It went into action. Um, and they, their desire was to know more um, through study and prayer and scriptures and fasting. Um, so I look back at my conversion and, um, and I think everyone has a moment in time where they have this fundamental aha through the Holy Ghost that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true. The gospel of Jesus Christ is true. And when we do, we have a desire to serve him, to learn more, and to act upon those. And then the danger comes um, to us when we become casual. And I just hope and pray that I can have that passion and desire constantly that that will never, I never fall asleep. Because I have in my life at certain times, you know, just kind of things are just rolling a little bit, you know, just going fine. And usually when something um, challenging or um, a trial comes in, then, then that desire increases. 
I think the challenge is to keep that sense of urgency, or as President Nelson says, that momentum moving and strong and the desired um, um, continual uh, that leads into action. I don't know, that was just my thought about how that could relate to me. I think um, a lot of times for me as well, um, there's a there's a song that I really like and and one of the lines in there um, from the church is, I hope I never get over what you've done for me. And I, I think it's so easy for us to sometimes fall into to have miracles in our lives and then we just kind of we just kind of go a different way and you know we're it's not that we've forgotten but we didn't let it change us right that's the step that we have to have to always follow with that's the true conversion that's becoming like Christ um, but that's one of the things that I certainly pray for on a regular basis is that I never get over what the Lord has done for me. I like that. I like that, Courtney. I like that a lot. Yeah. All right, moving on to insights number two. We'll go with uh, KB. Alma 19, 36. And thus the work of the Lord did commence among the Lamanites. Thus the Lord did begin to pour out his spirits upon them, spirit upon them. And we see that his arm is extended to all people who will repent and believe on his name. And Delbert A. Stapley um, gave a talk in, in 1977 called The Blessings of Righteous Obedience. Um, being willing to repent and believe on his name um, and the foundation of obedience is um, helps that to manifest itself. And he begins by saying, my brothers and sisters and friends, one goal that, mo that most of us share in this life is the desire to achieve true joy and lasting happiness. There is only one way to do this, and that is by being obedient to all the commandments of God. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have voluntarily entered into holy covenants, promising to obey the Lord's commandments. Willing, righteous obedience leads to celestial life. Indeed, there is no eternal progress without it. Yet obedience to the commandments of God seems to be one of man's most difficult challenges. Some people do not obey because they feel their free agency will be trampled upon if they consider themselves subservient to church authorities or enter into binding ordinances. Others willfully chose, choose an existence of being contrary to the nature of happiness. Still others pro um, products of an undisciplined life persist in their weaknesses and justify their course of action by shrugging and saying, that's just the way I am. Disobedience to God and his chosen servants ignores the fact that we are all the chil children of our an eternal father who has endowed us with ca the capacity to be as he and his son, Jesus Christ, are perfected, glorified, holy personages. Often we forget that obedience must be learned. Even Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God, learned perfect obedience, which qualified him to serve as our lawgiver and Lord. First of all, we have not been left to walk alone. The Lord has clearly revealed his will concerning his children and shown us his plan for redemption. His laws are explicitly recorded in the standard works of the church, which are the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, we cannot keep all the commandments without first knowing them, and we cannot expect to know all or more than we know now. We now know unless we comply with or keep those we have already received. Concerning scripture study, the prophet also taught 
he who reads it oftenest will like it best. The scriptures contain the promises of the Lord and his obedient children. Where the Lord God commands, he also promises great rewards to those who obey. We read from the Bible, and it can and it shall come to pass. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do his, all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Now I quote from the Book of Mormon, and behold, all that ye he requires of you is to keep his commandments, and he has promised you that if ye would keep his commandments, ye should prosper in the land, and he never doth vary from that which he has said. Therefore, if ye do keep his commandments, he doth bless you and prosper you. And now in the first place, he hath created you and granted unto you your lives, for which ye are indebted unto him. And secondly, he doth require that ye should do as he hath commanded you, for which if ye do, he doth immediately bless you, and therefore he hath paid you, and ye are still indebted unto him, and are and will be forever and ever. Next from the doctrine and covenants, for if ye, you will be, sorry, for if you will that I give unto you a place in the celestial world, ye must, you must prepare yourselves by doing the things which I have commanded you and required of you. I, the Lord, am abound when ye are, when ye, ye do what I say, but when ye do not what I say, ye have no promise. Finally, from the pearl of great price, and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. And they who keep their first estate shall be added upon, and they who keep not their first estate shall not be have glory in the same kingdom with those who keep their first estate. And they who keep the second estate shall have glory added upon their heads forever and ever. These scriptural passages clearly state that great rewards are promised to those who obey. A second way we learn obedience is by following the counsel of living prophets and other appointed church leaders. We are fortunate to live in a time when a living prophet is on the earth to counsel and guide us. Our Heavenly Father communicates his will through his prophet, and God will not permit his prophets who lead his people astray. The importance of the words of God's prophet have, has been clearly stated to the church as follows. Thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments, which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me. For his word ye shall receive as if from mine own mouth in all patience and faith. Then follows this promise to us when we heed the Lord's admonition, for by doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, and the Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before you and cause the heavens to shake for your good and his name's glory. The Lord has also provided local authorities, stake and dis district presidents, bishops, and branch presidents in a letter from the first presidency dated January 29th, 1973, church, church, church members were admonished. The Lord has so organized his church that there is accessible to that there is accessible to every member, man, woman, and child, a spiritual advisor and a temporal counselor as well, who knows them intimately and who knows the circumstances and conditions on, of, out of which their problems come, and who by reason of his ordination is entitled to an endowment from our Heavenly Father of the necessary discernment and inspiration of the Lord to enable him to give the advice which the one is in trouble is so much need, so much needs. We refer to the bishop or branch president, if the bishop or president needs assistance, he may go to the stake or mission president. These brethren may in turn seek counsel for one of the general authorities should such be necessary. And you can keep going. Third, we learn obedience by disciplining our lives in all things. One process by which we discipline our lives is by repentance, for it is the way to annul the effects of the previous lack of obedience in one's life. 
We must recognize that a mortality has been granted to us as a probationary state where all physical appetites are to be mastered. It is far more difficult to repent in the spirit world of sins, which involve physical habits and actions. The words of Amulek in the Book of Mormon give emphasis to this principle. Behold, he said, now is the time and the day for your salvation. This life is a time for men to prepare to meet God. If we do not improve our time while in this, or in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, wherein there can be no labor performed. That same spirit which doth possess your bodies at the time that you go out of this life, that same spirit will have power to possess your body in the eternal world. Finally, we learn obedience as the Savior did by the things which we suffer. As we consider the lives of saints in both past and present dispensations, we learn their lives were refined by affliction, hardship, persecution, and personal suffering. Job, who was no stranger to affliction, said in the time of his trials, God knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me. I shall come forth as gold. In the despair of his own personal suffering, Joseph Smith was reminded that suffering can make saints of mortal men when they are willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon them, even as a child does submit to his father. Sometimes in the eternities to come, we will see that our trials were calculated to cause us to turn to our Heavenly Father for strength and support. Any affliction or suffering we are called upon to bear may be directed to give us experience, refinement, and perfection. The Lord has revealed in this dispensation that our rewards in the eternities are predict predicated on our level of obedience. If we are fully obedient to celestial law, fulfilling the laws of Christ, we will be worthy of a celestial glory. But for those who do not fully comply with celestial law, other lesser degrees of glory have been prepared for the scripture's record. They who are not sanctified through the law of Christ must inherit another kingdom, even that of a terrestrial kingdom or that of a celestial kingdom. For he who is not able to abide the law of celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. And this is the promised reward for those who completely comply with the laws of celestial kingdom and endure to the end. They are they into whose hands the Father has given all things. <clears throat> can scroll up. Yeah, thank you. Um, they are they who are priests and kings who have received of his fullness and of his glory. In the light of these glorious promises, it is difficult to understand how any of our Heavenly Father's children would voluntarily choose anything less than the best of our God has to offer. Perhaps it would be well for each of us to reassess ourselves to determine where we presently stand in relation to the fundamental law of the celestial kingdom, the law of obedience. The result should reveal to us which kingdom we have chosen as our goal. For, in goal. for instance, do I study and ponder the scriptures in an effort to know the will of God and understand his commandments regarding his children? Two. Do I follow the counsel of God's living prophet, or do I merely select those things with which I agree with disregarding the others? Three, do I seek the advice and counsel of my bishop and stake present on matters of concern to me and my family? Four, am I earn earnestly striving to discipline myself, placing my physical appetites under the subjection of my will? Five, am I making every effort to repent of past or present wrongdoings and correct them by doing right? Six, do I have an attitude of faith in God, even though I experience trials, adversity, and affliction? And do I bear my and, and do I bear my burden without a complaining spirit? <clears throat> our willingness to comply with the commandments of God is a witness of our faith in Him and our love for Him. A rebellious disposition, disposition cannot inherit the celestial kingdom. In the doctrine of covenants we learn, but behold, they have not learned to be obedient in the things which I required at their hands, but are full of all manner of evil, and do not impart of their substance as becometh saints to the poor and afflicted among them, and are not united according to the union required by the law of the celestial kingdom. And Zion cannot be built up unless it is the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. Otherwise, I cannot receive her unto myself. And my pe people must needs be chastened till they learn obedience. And then scroll up. If it must needs be by the things which they suffer, 
by reading the scriptures, heeding the counsel of God's prophets and other divinely called church leaders, disciplining our lives and enduring our burdens in faith, our nature shall become refined and perfected. May we keep before us this wisdom which flowed from the pen of the prophet Joseph Smith and the early saints of this dispensation. In obedience, there is joy and peace and spotted, unalloyed, and as God has designed our happiness, he never will institute an ordinance or give a commandment to his people that is not calculated in its nature to promote that happiness, which he has designed and which will not end in the greatest amount of good and glory to those who become the recipients of his law and ordinances. When the Lord commands, <clears throat> do it, was a rule in the life of the first prophet of this dispensation. May that be the motto and practice of each one of us. So if you go back up to the scripture that we started with, that we jumped into obedience. And thus the word of the Lord did commence among the Lamanites. Thus the Lord did begin to pour out his spirit upon them. And we see that his arms extended to all people who repent and believe on his name. And that fundamental principle of the celestial kingdom is the law of obedience um, and they embarked into that environment and i i think those questions are really important to see and navigate to see if we are creating and and are we in that zone um, of which they were talking Thank you. I love these questions because, boy, one's like glaring at me. <laughs> you know, uh, I think I need to have a talk with my husband about my chip addiction <laughs> and <Your> popcorn. <laughs> 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 because I go crazy with that stuff. Place <laughs> the physical appetite under uh -huh. the of my will you know i know i i i over the last year i i put on 10 pounds and and i just kept saying you know it's okay you know i'm still feeling good and until until i started training again for a half a marathon i said no it's not okay <laughs> this is not working out very well and i just i had a hard time just just buckle down and get back into, you know, a really controlled um, diet. And I, over the last couple of days, I just, by do, starting that just a couple of days ago, it's like, why did I wait so long? You know, those little physical appetites. Ah, oh, yeah, I'll just have a little more of this. I'll have a little more of that. And it, it, it does, um, change your ability your energy and all of that so i'm with you i i get that and i and and i know that it's, it's one of those refinements but it reminds me of what president nelson said um about you know about you know addictions and mentioning food as one and i definitely have a sweet tooth <laughs> Well, he's really hammering me this weekend because um, we participated, our ward participated in a um, a pilot program that uh, the church is uh, bringing and uh, to the youth. And uh, it's very interesting, but addictions is what is really what they're, we're striving to get at um, and um, healthy habits. And yeah. obviously that involves, you know, not just, you know, temporal things, you know, physical things, but spiritual and emotional things, and uh, an awareness of that uh, uh, as for parents, but also for teenagers to be able to, you know, get, you know, communicate uh, properly. But, you know, it boils down to, um, you know, self discipline and self mastery. And that this is a, you know, glaring thing to me this weekend. And, and this question here, Am I earnestly striving to discipline myself? Well, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I, I do. But that, I, that I'm earnestly doing it? I could say not. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is, a, this is a good set of questions to, to begin with. Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, Bridal Your Passions has always been a very interesting scripture to me because when we were studying this and I was a lot younger, my family had horses. And so my parents made a point to talk about how, you know, a horse can be 1,200 pounds, 1,300 pounds, and yet we're able to control them, right, with this little bit and this bridle. And so we spent a lot of time talking about, do you want to be led around by, um, you know, fast food or eating chocolate or, you know, because when we don't give that bridle to the Lord, we're just creating opportunities for Satan to come in and like substitute that. So I've never forgotten um, the bridle, your passions. And I always think of a horse. Cause I'm like, I do not want to be that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to think about that. I'm thinking about, I don't, you know, popcorn and, and chips. I don't want to be bridled. <laughs> Let around. Well, maybe there's moderation in all things, right? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you that about chocolate then. Is that your, your Achilles tendon chocolate? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mine is popcorn and chips. Yeah, mine's definitely chocolate. Even though I, do, you know, I, I, I do sugar free as much as possible or dark chocolate when I do it. But you know, I oh, I overdo it. Oh, I can have one more a little bit. I mean, you know, it's 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 a bad thing. No, I can't because i have clearly, you know. But I, but it did give me a perspective, and it's it's not just you know. Because per se, popcorn or chips or chocolate aren't bad. And, no. you know, and it's not, you know, it's, and, and, and it's not that, that we're like, you know, what's that word I'm looking for? Um, uh, um, that one of the cardinal sins, uh, glutton, you know, that we're glutton with it, you know, we just like sit there and eat bags and bags, right? No, it's not that. It's just that, you know, that phrase, earnestly striving to discipline myself and, Am I? Well, no, I don't. I, you know, but that's really what we should be because, you know, the body is a temple for the, you know, for the Lord and his spirit. And am I really honoring that? You know, am I earnestly striving? So that's, that's the gist of it. You know, not that in and of itself is bad. It's just that, am I, am I being controlled by it? Yes. So good discussion on that. Well, the last insight comes from uh, Alma 2030. And in that verse, it says, and as it happened, it was their lot to have fallen to the hands of a more hardened and more stiff necked people. Therefore, they would not hearken unto their words. And they had cast them out and had smitten them and had driven them from house to house and from place to place, even until they had arrived in the land of Medonai. And there they were taken and cast into prison and bound with strong cords and kept in prison for many days and were delivered by Lamoni and Ammon. So in the student manual, it says, or in a student manual, it says, a more hardened and more stiff necked people. The record states that Aaron and his companions served among those who were a more hardened and a more stiff necked people. Their experience parallels the experience of many who try to teach those who have either no interest in or who are antagonistic toward the gospel. President Henry B. Irene explained why we must still try to reach every soul. Why should I speak to anyone about the gospel who seems content? What danger is there to them or to me if I do or say nothing? Well, the danger may be hard to see, but it is real, both for them and for us. For instance, at some moment in the world to come, Everyone you will ever meet will know what you know now. They will know that the only way to live forever in association with our families and in the presence of our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, was to choose to enter into the gate by baptism at the hands of those with authority from God. They will know that the only way families can be together forever is to accept and keep sacred covenants offered in the temples of God on this earth. And they will know that you knew and they will remember whether you offered them what someone had offered you. Bam, there it is. From a talk, it's not titled, it's, it's untitled, by President Reuben J. Clark. He said, 
of the Savior, he says, nearly 2,000 years ago, the Lord, walking by the seashore, again saw brethren whom he had seen before. They were busy with their nets and their boats, and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They had little training, little education, and they were of humble folk of the land in which they lived, but they had spirit and spirituality. They had faith. So they left their nets and their boats and followed him. And that is all the Lord requires of us today. I think perhaps he cares a little for our achievements among men, little for what we have done in a worldly way in the past, provided we come to him with a qualification which seems to me to be all-embracing, a pure heart and a contrite spirit. Without these, we shall fail. With them, we can but succeed. The Lord expects this from all of us at all times and on all occasions. He expects us to forget the honors we may have gained from this world and our work therein is and to come to him humble and contrite with a firm desire and a firm determination to follow him and become fishers of men. And so he says, may this be our lot. I hope I humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. In the book of Daniel in chapter 12, verse 13, it talks to how Daniel, how uh, Daniel's lot, it says, but go thou thy way till, till the end, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the, end of the, at the end of days. So here we are. This is from another talk entitled, I didn't put the title there. I'm sorry. Um, we're, we're here struggling and trying to introduce correct principles. And we try to advance not only the interests of the church of God, but the kingdom of God and God will have a kingdom. It's a given. I hope you will not tell it to anybody if I tell you something. God will have a kingdom and he will have rule and dominion for this earth belongs to him and he will possess it and his saints will inherit it at last. We do not used to be afraid of talking about these things. In former times, they told us that the saints of the Most High should finally take the kingdom and the greatness of his kingdom, which should be given to the saints of the Most High God. Do you believe it? I happen to be one who believes it, and I prophesy that it will be fulfilled. But we are a sorry lot of people to do a thing of, of that kind, are we not? We have not made much progress yet in the race. We are only preparing for it. Many of us cannot do what Brother Joseph Smith was talking about yesterday. That is making a sacrifice and feel that we are for God and his kingdom. We can hardly get out of it. I tell you how some of us feel. God bless me and my wife, my son John and his wife, us four and no more. Amen. <laughs> that, feeling, <laughs> that feeling is a long way from the other. God feels interested in the welfare of the whole human family. What of the saints? Yes, and the others too. But the others do not have the priesthood. The others, if they obtain a celestial glory, will have to obtain it through the Latter-day Saints. What matter, manner of people ought we to be? A little different from what we are. We think it troublesome sometimes to pay our tithing. We think it troublesome sometimes to pray in, in our families. We think it troublesome sometimes to feed the poor and take care of the destitute. Well, suppose we were to change places a little while with them. How would you feel then? Would you feel that it was much better to give than to receive? We want our feelings and sympathies drawn out, and God has placed us where we are in order that we may be preserved to receive instructions from his hands. We have in our school operations what we call normal schools to prepare teachers to teach others. Now, the Lord has a normal school in Utah. He's preparing us in a variety of ways. Sometimes we have not had have enough snow in the winter season and consequently a scarcity of water in the summer. Sometimes too much rain and sometimes not enough. We have some wise and some unwise, and we have some rich and some poor. Yes, we have some who are poor among us, and why? We would not know what it was to see persons in those circumstances if we did not have some among us. And then the opportunity is afforded us to show our kindness and to develop within us that fellow feeling we sometimes talk about. But we do not want to call them poor, for some of uh, them are just as good as we are and some perhaps a little better than many of us. If good people are suffering for the common necessities of life, 
the scriptures say, if a man having this world's good see his brother in need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion, how dwelleth the love of God in him? And in regard to those matters, we ought to look to the wants of everybody that, however more particularly devolves, devolves upon the bishops and the brethren of the Aaronic priesthood, do not let us make paupers of them, but let us treat them as brethren and sisters, as good, honorable men and women. Let us see that they are provided for. I've seen some people who would get down upon their knees and pray most heartily to God to feed the poor and clothe the naked. Now, I would never ask the Lord to do a thing that I would not do. If we have them among us, suppose we go at it and relieve them. I do not think we have much of that to do here, but enough perhaps to draw forth your good feelings and sympathies. And if people sustain misfortune of any kind, look after them and bestow upon them those things necessary for their welfare and happiness. And God will bless us in so doing. I would a great deal rather that you would take, say, a sack of flour, some beef, a hundred of sugar, some butter and cheese and clothing and fuel of, and such comforts and conveniences of life and thus try to make people feel happy than all the prayers you could offer up to the Lord about it and he would rather see it too. That is the proper way to do things. In receiving blessings ourselves, try to distribute them and God will bless and guide us in, in the ways of peace. I just love the way the brethren in this dispensation spoke they spoke their heart and they did not mince words whatsoever um i loved this scripture that again how the um sons of mosiah that it it was their lot to have fallen into hands of a more hardened and stiff-necked people and they hadn't done anything they hadn't sinned in fact if anything they you know, Ammon went one direction and they went in another direction to do just that what they had been uh, uh, compelled to do by his spirit and begged the king to allow them to go. And, uh, and uh, they didn't complain or murmur about it. And they did suffer quite a bit. But it was their lot to have, have uh, those more hardened people. And by the way of just... Um, a side note, those that were hardened and stiff-necked people, those were um, Nephite that had fallen away and were, um, that had had the gospel. And, um, uh, uh, but they, um, they persisted in, in, um, in uh, being obedient to the Lord, as KB has um, spoken about, uh, being obedient. And they had much success, albeit they had, to undergo some harsh trials, but they did, they were successful because that is uh, what the Lord had deemed for them to do, but they had been obedient in, in the commandment of, um, of serving in the way that they, they had. So back to what is our lot, brothers and sisters, what is falling into our hands as to what our role is in our journey, not just as individuals and where we're at in our wards and in our stakes, you know, and, um, but more as a as a as a generation um, speaking generally. You know, what is our lot? Well, the lot that has been as it has always been it is our obligation. It is our commandment that we share our blessing of the gospel to those. But sometimes it can only happen when we serve them in their temporal needs to be able to soften their hearts so that they can hear the good word. Just like the, the brethren here have demonstrated that we can pray and say for, you know, world peace, all we want. And, uh, you know, for all the poor, you know, but if we're not truly looking and seeking and how we can be the extension of the Lord's um hands uh we will fail and these people will know as uh president irene has said they will know and they will remember that we knew and remembered whether we offered that to them or not that's pretty uh harsh words when you think about it and if you they knew that because we will know all things that you had um uh, 
these blessings and you never once shared it with them. Uh, I hope that I'm not guilty of that ever. I want to make sure that I share my faith with everyone that crosses my path. So that, that was what uh, my insights were for, um, for this week. Wow, that wow. was a long statement there from President Irene. That's, that's something to think about. They will know that the only way families can be together is to accept and keep sacred covenants offered in the temples of God on this earth. And they will know that you knew. Yeah. Remember whether you offered them that someone had offered you. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that makes you take a, you know, have I done... Have, have I opened my mouth? Have I been on that watchtower? Um, am I am am I like Aaron and Ammon and sons of Messiah? You know, have yeah. Take a little in inventory tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, we yeah. certainly do. Well, thank you for listening and please uh, add your comments below and uh, we will see you again next week for uh, another of our weekly insights to the Book of Mormon. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.